Yeah. So the the uh, title is Some Lessons Learned Working in Hydrology and Water Resources Engineering for 57 Years. And to do this, a personal assessment of time and place. So the world events that influence deployment of capital, attention to societal concerns about flooding, droughts and pollution abatement and cleanup have influenced what research could be done and when. Advice from mentors and the interest of my collaborating colleagues have influenced the research topics addressed. The developments in instruments, space-based remote sensing of planet Earth and computing and information transfer have defined the timing of much of our work. One of the largest challenges all of us face is deciding what evolving technologies to embrace. Possible, I tried to work on topics for which I thought we'd need improved tools, including observations, about 10 to 20 years before they were needed. Topics I want to cover, landmark technologic developments since, the, since I was born in 44, follow-up technology, issues in hydrology and water resources engineering, the importance of mentors, choosing research topics, and then some take on messages. So first of all, landmark technological developments. I start with, I think the most important one, the point contact transistor was first demonstrated at Bell Labs on December 23, 1947. It replaced the vacuum tube diode and made the modern world as we know it electronically possible. The three people behind that were Walter Bratton, William Shockley and John Bardeen. They picked up the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. John Bardeen is one of only five scientists to win two Nobel Prizes. His second was for superconductivity, and the other four were Marie Curie, Linus Pauling, Frederick Sanger, and Barry Sharpless. Famous picture there of James Watson and Francis Crick and their publication in Nature 53, Double Helix. They picked up the 1962 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So here we have April 25, 1953, Nature, molecular structure of nucleic acids. And there's the end of it, one page. If only people could write so well today. Vacuum tube technology, television came to Australia in 1956. And that, what we see there, is the precursor of modern screens for much of what we do. Sputnik, launched by the USSR on October 4, 1957, changed the world. It weighed about 84 kilograms and went around the world in about 96 minutes. And as a kid in Australia, we're out staring at night in amazement at this thing. The integrated circuit, Jack Kilby's original integrated circuit in 1958. It's a half inch scale and it was made of human hair size, 70,000 nanometer bonding wires, to wire together separate transistors, capacitors, and resistors into a circuit. It's now called a hybrid integrate circuit. Kilby was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics quite some time later in the year 2000. Future Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, in 1959, in a famous talk at Caltech, there's plenty of room at the bottom and just his part on miniaturizing the computer. Why can't we make them very small, make them of little wires, little elements, and by little, I mean little. For instance, the wires should be 10 or 100 atoms in diameter, and the circuit should be a few thousand angstroms across. Come in now, a very, very significant part, the laser, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation was made by Theodore Maimon, May 16, 1960. Described this in a paper in Nature, Simulated Optical Radiation in Ruby. Have it, August 6, 1960. There's the first part of the paper. There's the rest of it, less than three quarters of a page. This particular part, probably more important per word than any of the papers published by Nature over the past century. That was in the obituary written on, on him by Charles Town in Nature in 27, 2007. 
Dr. Towns shared the 64 Nobel Prize in Physics for inventing the laser and maser. First humans on the moon, Apollo 11 was huge. So you see the famous three, you see Edwin Aldrin, Lunar Module Eagle. That was an incredible accomplishment at that time. But what really came about is the space exploration program had a major influence on the speed of technological development. I want to do some follow-on technology. And the first one I want to pick up is the Hewlett Packard HP35 pocket calculator. It had 35 function keys and was made and sold between 72 and 75. 100,000 sold in the first year. Just about every engineer wanted one to try and solve things at more than $300. And today you'd have to pay $2,270 for the same device. The circuit board, that's what it looked like, but there it had one of the earliest integrated circuits, a MOSTEC 6020 in there, and all the rest is fairly standard gear. The modern theodolite, a total station, which is a huge advance. It had electronic distance measuring using a laser and prism, angular measurements, automatic data reduction of XYZ, and it combined a laser, a theodolite, and a calculator. Fiber optic data transmission since about 1981. It was a phenomenal achievement being able to make the thin fiber optic class. I want to go now to NASA's Earth Science Mission in Operation, Development, Formulation. And this is their 2015 part. So first of all, they had extended operations, trim, and down through there. And you notice there, Landsat 7 and Terra which was the first really useful device we had in hydrology. And GRACE worked up until June 2017. And this indicating what was in formulation and people had to wait. I want to emphasize the importance of Landsat. This is the 52nd year of continuous mapping of Earth's surface. Landsat 1 was launched on July 23, 1972 and Landsat 9 was launched September 27, 2021. But there's a very, very important person behind this, the woman who brought us the world. A half century ago, Virginia Norwood, class of 47 at MIT, invented the first multispectral scanner to image Earth from space. Landsat 1 and its successors have been scanning the planet continuously ever since. And there's the tech uh, review. You can find it if you want it later. There is a photograph of her. Every user of Landsat data owes a huge debt to Virginia Norwood, who died in March 26 of 2023, for exceptional vision, scientific, engineering, and managerial skills. She was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering in February 2023 for her death. At least they got it right and recognized her. I go now to NASA Earth Fleet, December 2023. 20, uh, Look there and you see Sentinel, and we heard something about that last week. Soil mapping, soil moisture, active passive observatory has been running since 2015. Grace follow on since May 22 of 2018. ISAT 2, ice cloud and elevation since uh, September 2018. And most recently, surface water and ocean topography since December 15. People are sort of sorting out the basis and calibrating the stuff for SWAT. Advances during my lifetime in computers, all forms of surveying the states of the Earth's critical zone, information transfer, data storage and retrieval, accessibility of the libraries of the world, think internet and everything that goes with it. Totally unimaginable 57 years ago when I started out. I want to give you some examples of advances in computing tools. First of all, my first Fortran code was written in 1966 for an IBM 1130 computer. And there it was, general virtual work analysis of nonlinear elastic structures. It was first written by my mentor, Peter Kleeman, and I revised it to the 1130 in 66. There you have a photograph of IBM 1130 computing system in 1965. It had 64,000 bytes of core memory. That was the total capacity of the machine. And we thought it was a gift from the gods. 
1967, when I was a grad student at Stanford, IBM 1316 removable disk pack, this was enormous advance. There you're looking at it. It was four inches deep. It had six 14-inch disks. It weighed 10 pounds, and it could store 7.25 megabytes. Advance on now to 2021, you could get two terabytes in a thumb drive for $40. This is progress. If you look at these devices here, you're looking at handheld supercomputers approaching Feynman's Little. The transistor industry standard was seven nanometers in 2021. Three nanometers are in production in 2024. IBM has developed a two nanometer transistor now. There have been many who did not see a bright future following World War II, the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Their concerns were for nuclear war, challenges of population growth, and possible famines. Fortunately, all proved wrong. Think about the Cold War, the possibility of nuclear annihilation. And Neville Shute Norway wrote a novel in 1957 that was entitled On the Beach. And it was an end of the world novel. It was all about World War III, nuclear holocaust, and the last survivors were in Melbourne, Australia in 1964. Radiation poisoning had killed off the world population. Doom and gloom about world population, 1968. Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb. In 1970, there were 3.7 billion on the planet. In 2024, there are 8 billion, according to the United Nations. Famine and extreme pessimism. Paddock Brothers wrote their book, Famine, 1975. And they proposed triage for whole countries. They just wrote them off in their 1967 book. And the question was, who will survive? They completely missed the Green Revolution and got it wrong. So despite great geopolitical turbulence, doom and gloom about the future, and worldwide inhumanity during my life, with all these advances, I remain an optimist for ongoing progress in all we do. And I wrote about this in 2011. It was an invited perspective why I'm an optimist in water resource research in 2011. And I'll put down there the part I want to emphasize. I conclude with a long-term community grand challenge, the coupled modeling of the ocean, atmosphere, landform hydrologic cycle for the purpose of long lead time hydrologic prediction. This is what we need to do, not the piecemeal stuff. So I want to pick up now issues in hydrology and water resources engineering. <laughs> First of all, if we're going to do it, we need to pay attention to the earth energy balance and the hydrologic cycle. So first of all, the thermal energy balance of planet Earth, and this was first published in the Earth Observer in July, August, 2016. It's figure seven, the global annual mean energy balances of Earth for approximately 2000 to 2010, all fluxes are in watts per square meter. First of all, we have incoming solar. 340.2 plus or minus 0.1, measured very, very accurately. We have in here reflected solar, 100 plus or minus 2, less well. We have outgoing long wave right radiation, 239.7 plus or minus 3. We look now at the principal elements of the atmospheric energy balance. So we look at atmospheric absorption of short wave, 75 plus or minus 10. We look at sensible heating, 24 plus or minus 7. We look at latent heating, the evaporation, 88 plus or minus 10. And all sky long wave radio absorption, 187.9 plus or minus 12.5. We look at the top of the atmosphere imbalance. So measured incoming solar and outgoing total of everything else. It turns out 0.6 plus or minus 0.4 it should be zero plus or minus zero. It's very, very close. That's the single best measure people have. Uncertainties. Just look at that atmospheric absorption, 75 plus or minus 10. And you look at their sky long wave absorption, 187.9 plus or minus 12.5. Getting those mixes closer to what they should be is what's essential to get hydrology right. Global importance of soil. Uh, I want to look at land cover change over time. 
And this is from the 2016 Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, a marvelous publication. And it's looking at agriculture and pasture land use percentage. So dark green is very, very, has none. So you look at their, their estimates of the year 1000 BC, 3000 years ago, you see a few patches where people were hanging out. You look now at AD 2000 and you see massive areas where we've made changes. This is the most significant hydrologic change since the ice age and dwarfs everything else. If we look at land degradation, also from the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, you look at water erosion, so the blue patches are where that's the case. And if you look at the other part, sorry, you look at the other part, wind erosion are the uh, brownie color. We look now at soil biodiversity index and the soil health is one of the most important things to pay attention to. So this is the Americas and you look there with green, it's high and you look there where it's low. You look at the rest of the world and you see huge swaths where the soil biodiversity is very, very low. The first quantitative measures of atmospheric global precipitable moisture, this is something we need to know. This was in the source was GWX News, August of 94, annual cycles of global and hemispheric average precipitable water for 1988. This was a heroic effort at the time. So January through December, Southern Hemisphere, clearly you have more in the summer and less in the winter. Northern Hemisphere is the reverse and the global is the average. But what's very instructive is where the water is. Now let's look at this. We're looking at the global average. From the surface to 700 millibars, the great bulk of the water is. So on the bottom, 30% of the atmosphere is where the bulk of the water is. And there's the total. We run a line across there, it's about 24 millimeters. So average precipitable moisture in the atmosphere is about 24 millimeters, almost one inch. And that turns out to be 1.64 by 10 to the 13 tons. I can't wrap my head around a number that big. Get now to fundamental hydrology. Hydrology is concerned with determining the water budget and associated thermal energy budget, evaporation, snow, and ice. A major effort is in rainfall runoff modeling. First of all, you choose a model, you define the catchment boundaries and the subsurface is not well defined. Select the input time series, typically precipitation, potential evapotranspiration, and determine suitable model parameters, usually by forcing the predict match the observed series. And the historical reason for that is that's one of the few things people had measured. experience the greatest modeling difficulties. So consider the conterminous US. About two thirds of the precipitation is evaporated or transpired. So let's look at Conus, and I want to show maps of average annual precipitation and runoff. And the first is annual average precipitation. So that fine print there is simply saying that the PRISM model using data from 61 to 90 was used to construct that map. Some of you know that PRISM is limited. So you look up there, the legend in inches, that part there is get between five and 10 inches a year, and you come over there 50 to 60. So we have this huge gradient of precipitation across the continent. We look at average US annual runoff, and you look at all that pale green there, that's less than an inch, not much. Evaporation's the big deal. And you look in there greater than 20 inches. So a caution to users of big data, what challenges are faced when constructing an average annual runoff map or any spatial map? You must know the limits of the data set and the most recent four papers I've read on this, they didn't discuss that. The first heroic effort for Conus was the USGS in 1949 using measured stream flow and hand-drawn contours. The USGS professional staff had extensive knowledge of all data records used. And, uh, here it is, US Geological Survey Circular 52, June of 49, annual runoff in the United States by Walter Langbein and others. Langbein is one of the giants of the profession. And there you see the first map. 
First nothing, annual average runoff Conus 1949. Ma major variation in contours and exceptional detail. Just look at the contour detail you're seeing in here. And I find that much more informative than the more general spatial maps people slop out today. But there's something even more valuable. On a summary on page 12, annual runoff from the United States ranges from less than a quarter of an inch in the intermountain deserts to more than 80 inches in the Olympic and Cascade Mountains of Washington and Oregon. The countrywide average is approximately 8.5 inches, which subtracted by the average precipitation of 30 inches indicates that evapotranspiration loss is about 21 and a half inches. That's where the roughly two thirds comes from. Incidentally, the 30 inches of precip is an undercount. So with all this background, what climatic reasons pose the greatest difficulty for and create the greatest need for improved precipitation measurement? Well, let's look at the precip map again. So we look at atmospheric river storms and they come in here and they are to be you know, tracking. We look at mixed rain and snow that's all over the continent. We look at convective storms, very hard to measure by anything. And infrequent storms, some of our biggest challenges, getting everything right and the timing right. What regions have the least runoff signal for model building, calibration, and testing? Well, we go back to our average US annual runoff. Less than an inch, there's almost no signal. And we come in there one to 10 inches that's barely adequate, extremely challenging. Just look how little of the country we have enough signal to do and do sensibly. I want to get now to hydrology and water resources. The principal societal and ecological issues in hydrology and hydrologic and water resource engineering are in no particular order. First of all, water storage is liquid. So interception, that's the moisture on vegetation that evaporates. Depression storage. Soil moisture, it's not necessarily uniformly through the soil. And there's a case of two inch plus storms that run one after the other onto bone dry soil and you just see how little the water had gone down. Water stored in lakes. We come now to the principal aquifers of Conus. And what matters here are the surface, subsurface flow paths and aquifer storage. And these are very hard to pin down. Surface water storage is solid, some ice, snow. We have a lot of people around here who do that. Floods. The only thing you need to know about floods is the river owns the valley. And if we all paid attention to that, we would not have flood disasters. We have here New Orleans, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the most severe hit they've ever had, August 23 to 2005. And there we have the source of that. So there you have coastal, riverine, and extreme rain giving rise to that. Ice jam flooding. You end up with ice blocking the rivers, water piling up behind, the dam breaks, and you end up with flooding. Alaska 2013, you see some there. Ohio 2014, you're looking at those blocks of ice and another one for that same location. And there's an old freezer in the water there. Water for food and fiber. Here we have a case of uh, an oasis in Libya. And lo and behold, those circles are center pivot irrigation. They're mining groundwater. We're looking here, we see irrigation effect. Water is a change agent. So here we're seeing erosion taking place transport agent, sediments, and dissolved substances. Grout, you're looking at uh, not all that far apart, and you're looking at the uh, Lake Lanier in Georgia. You're looking at a riverbed, and that's a photo. That's one measure of grout, small and local. You look at this larger extent, and you look now at severe drought, 84, 85, and this is a NASA image. And here you have dark color, which is the most severe, so you have a very large area of going for a long time and disrupted to society. Groundwater use, including for drought mitigation. Groundwater reservoirs have known supply and considerable uncertainty about supply from surface reservoirs leading up to and during drought. I'm going to show you now the time history of US groundwater use from 1900 to 2000 and also on to 2008. And here's a map showing 40 of the major aquifers 
And this is work by my excellent colleague, Lenny Conakow from the USGS, Groundwater Depletion in the US, 1900 to 2008. That's the bit there. The explanation uh, we have there, groundwater depletion in cubic kilometers. So we go to California, 113 cubic kilometers estimated between uh, the starting out there from 1900 and 2000, but it increased to a total of 145 by 2008. We go to the Mississippi, 118, 182. You go to the Ogallala, 259 and 341. Now let's get some numbers here. 145 cubic kilometers at about 118 million acre feet, which is almost eight years of the Colorado River flow. The mean annual flow of the Colorado River is 15 million acre feet. We have a lot of work to do to recharge the aquifers. Water supply. There you have surface storage. There you have transport. Potable water, that tells the story. Water for ecology and salmon deaths because of insufficient water. Land use is a particularly interesting case. So here at Google Earth of Seattle, that's a scale of one mile, just get a sense of what it looks like. And down it shrunk that scale to make that line up with a Landsat image that I show in here. And I want to emphasize the urban land use, the heterogeneity of it, the land surface atmosphere interactions. So Puget Sound, Lake Washington, 35 kilometers. And we're looking at the urban domain, shown in that false color. And we look at the vegetated domain in that false color. There's a major difference in the mix of latent, which means evaporative and sensible heat between those domains. We also have the added anthropogenic sensible heat, the stuff we use to heat our houses and push out and also everything else that goes with it. Urban hydrology, poses some very, very interesting problems. It's the hydrologic and hydroecological infrastructure design, operation, and maintenance that's becoming the norm. If we look at urbanized areas and urban clusters in 2010 for the United States, we end up with needing large expenditures for hydrologic engineering infrastructure design and redesign for ecological and societal resilience and water reuse. Just pay attention to Seattle and look at all the stuff that's being spent to try and prevent combined sewer overflows. Hydrologic change when converting land for farming and forest harvesting. There you have a prairie. There you have a prairie that's changed completely. There's a permanent change in the temporal and spatial water budget, albedo, and latent and sensible heat. Increased wind and water erosion potential. If we look at uh, forest work, decadal scale change in temporal and spatial water budget, albedo, and latent and sensible heat. Increased water erosion potential. Landscape change, fire and renewal. You're looking at transient decadal scale change in temporal and spatial water budget, albedo, and latent and sensible heat. Landscape change, ecological imbalance. You're looking at trees killed by pine bark beetles. We look now at an issue of agricultural land drainage. This changes the game completely. And you're looking at surface ditch drainage here, and you're looking at the width there. The whole idea is have the drains to drop the water table so that people can farm. There you're looking at subsurface drainage. Now let's look at a landscape that is drained and productive. There's a permanent change in the temporal and spatial water budget, subsurface hydrology, and latent and sensible heat. But there's a very challenging one. You have enhanced transport of agrochemicals to rivers. If you look at the agricultural land in drainage enterprises, this map is from January 1 of 1950, and it's in the book, The Yearbook of Agriculture, 1955 Water. That book should be on every person's reading list to get a sense of what really matters in the whole field. And one dot there, each dot is 10,000 acres. And you look at the patches there, and you're looking at the upper Mississippi and so on, the whole bit there. And the grand total was almost 103 million acres in that time. That was 5.4% of Connors. So this major change, drainage, and being able to do uh, damage. If we go to the 2012 census, the most recent one I can find, 
they ended up there with 48.6 million subsurface and a grand total of 90.7 million acres, so it had dropped down to 4.8% of cost. So some consequences of farming practice and resulting hydrologic fluxes. If we look at nitrogen input to landscape, and we're looking at total nitrogen in metric tons per square kilometer, and let's just look at the more than eight and see where that happens to be. And we have a lot of underground drainage up there. And you look at the bottom wort dissolved oxygen, this is the 2014 uh, image. The black line indicates dissolved oxygen levels of two milligrams a liter, and the red is less than two. So you understand there's a huge ecological influence. So extensive work has been done on how legacy nitrogen limits water quality improvements in the Gulf of Mexico by Professor Nandita Basu, University of Waterloo. And this is a famous paper, Science for 2018, Legacy Nitrogen May Prevent Achievement of Water Quality Goals in the Gulf of Mexico. And she did that with her colleague, Van Meta. Virtual water transfers. This is something a lot of people don't pay attention to, but it's a big deal. Major work by Professor Megan Kona, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And you look at a map like that, and you're usually looking at the biological stuff there, but it's agricultural water flows within the United States, and this was published in 2015. So the sense of numbers, virtual water flows, this is one state to another, all the way they go, turns out to be 317 billion cubic meters per year, which is about 257 million acre feet, which is about 17 years worth of the Colorado River flow, which you all know is supply in seven states. There's the source. And here we have, that's Texas. This one's California. And the length there is the fraction. So you look at Texas, California, and others going around there. They're the bigger units. But notice where the arrows go. They go all over the place with stuff that's been grown with water in one place. I want to get now to scientific hydrology and hydrologic engineering. So developments in hydrologic science have been driven and will likely continue to be driven by societal needs. This is always the case. It's essential that the best practicable science be used in professional practice. Some guiding principles for advancing hydrologic science. And the first of these is the opportunities in hydrologic science published as the Eagleson Committee report in 1991. It provided a unifying holistic view of hydrologic sciences. An integrative framework for much of hydrologic science has been provided by focusing on the critical zone first introduced in basic research opportunities in earth sciences in uh, 2001. And there is the cover of the book goes with it. I'm guilty, together with Professor Gail Ashley from Rutgers and the late Professor Larry Wilde in Texas A&M, for introducing this framework to the NRC committee. There are now 46 critical zone observatories globally. If we look at this, the United States, there are nine, the network of nine critical zone observatories, and that was as published in 2017. So what's the critical zone? When you look down there, and most people are a little familiar with that, ground surface down into deep groundwater. And if you look at the scale going down from deep groundwater to fairly high up in the atmosphere, if you want a sense of scale, think about this. If you thought about planet Earth as a one meter diameter sphere, Mount Everest, tallest mountain, would be 0.7 of a millimeter sitting on top of that. And the Mariana Trench, the deepest place, would be 0.9 of a millimeter. We know precious little about the one meter domain. And our domain is roughly from about minus 0.1 to plus 0.7 millimeters above sea level. The challenges and opportunities in the hydrologic sciences. This was the 1991 report, 21 year, 20 years on and exploring new opportunities. So this was published in 2012 and provides broad examples of promising new opportunities to advance hydrologic science. A lot has happened in computing since this came out. Community leadership in advancing hydrologic science in the US, the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic and Science Incorporated, COASI, has taken a major role. 
are there possibilities for advancing hydrologic science using machine learning? Well, there's a commentary published in Water Resources Research in 2021, and what role does hydrologic science play in the age of machine learning? If you haven't read this, I suggest you have a look at it and be skeptical. They have some key points and so forth. I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's something that is crucial in what we do, the importance of mentors. We all need mentors across the age spectrum and engineering mistakes are repeated about every 30 years. There's a loss of institutional memory over about 30 years. And a prime example of this is the Oroville Dam spillway failure of February 27, 2017, which is probably known to many of you. And the forensic report is one of the most valuable things you could ever read about how to do things better. So there you see Oroville Dam spillway, February 27, 2017. And the cost of fixing that, the cost of replacement of the spillway over 2017 and 2018, and stabilization below the emergency spillway in 2018, cost $1.2 billion. And you taxpayers help pay a hell of a lot of that. So under mentors, seek a wise, older, 30 plus years mentor. Now I'm a bit limited there. Uh, and then others younger and older than yourself. Seek with the help of mentors, examples of inspiring work. This is what keeps us going. My mentors have influenced me in many ways. At undergraduate time, University of Newcastle, Australia, the late Professor Rupert Valentine made it possible for me to come to the United States for my graduate studies because of people he knew here. My bachelor's thesis supervisor, Dr. Peter Kleeman, is one of the most intelligent and talented people I have ever met. Graduate studies at Stanford, Bob Street for my master's thesis advisor, remains a very precious friend. The late Ray Lindsley, my doctoral advisor, precious colleague, mentor, and friend. University of Washington, I had three wonderful colleagues, the late Professor Gene Ritchie, the late Professor Colin Brown, and Professor Ron Neese. They kept me out of a lot of trouble. Externally, I've had many wonderful and still many others, generous colleagues of all ages, who are very helpful in all sorts of things. So choosing research topics. A short academic history, I guess you could kindly mention, I was on the internet, I'm a faculty here from 1970 to 2010. I've been emeritus since 2010. So I worked on a wide range of topics and where possible to match the interests of my younger colleagues published a maximum of two papers per topic, and fortunate to have exceptional co-workers. And if you want to get some details, you can just look it up, it's on the web. I had a major mid-career influence. The Nobel laureate, Sir Peter Medawar's book, Pluto's Republic, 1982. I first read it in January of 93. Now this guy is off the charts brilliant. Extract from his essay on induction. I reckon that for all the use it has been to science, about four fifths of my time has been wasted. And I believe this to be the common lot of people who are not merely playing follow my leader in research. If only about 20% of St. Peter's research was productive, the rest of us would be doing well if 5% of ours was potentially valuable. Okay, keep that in mind when you're spitting out the next papers. Uh, there's uh, Pluto's Republic and it also includes a collection of essays, The Art of the Soluble, which was done in 67. So research is very similar to the inventing process and major progress typically takes many years. An invention on average is about the 35th iteration of, for example, WD-40, the formula that was actually you know, put to work. Research is constrained by the intellectual environment of the times and the tools available. So measurement technology, people now take for granted things like LIDAR, computing capability, data storage and access, computing tools in different ways, software advances, and the thing to keep in mind there is rapid change and obsolescence. Control. So how have I chosen research topics? <laughs> Serendipity, 
application of known principles to provide needed solutions to problems within a time frame of five years or so. And I identify topics that I thought would need new tools and understanding to solve emerging major societal problems related to the water cycle in a time frame of 10 to 20 years or longer. So here's a case of serendipity responding to short-term needs of regulatory agency colleagues. I attended the International Symposium on Uncertainties in Hydrologic and Water Resource Systems at the University of Arizona in 1972. And the late Professor Alan Cornell, who was then at MIT, gave a wonderful lecture, First Order Analysis of Model and Parameter Uncertainty. Alan showed how to propagate the mean and variance of independent variables in any model, and I've used it extensively since. So here's an example of it. Water Resources Bullet in February 75, probabilistic methods in stream quality management with my colleague Dennis Lettenmeyer. And it was a first order uncertainty propagation, Streeter Phelps equations. Findings in this guided the building of EPA. EPA. Subtle guidance by a precious mentor. So here we have March of 79, ASCE, Journal of Water Resources Planning and Management. Water Resource System Planning in USA, 1776 to 1976. I was asked to put this in perspective. So I managed to dig out and track down the systems philosophy was first articulated about 1917 as best I could find. It was articulated by Arthur Morgan, chief engineer of the Miami Conservancy District. But I want to point out in this paper what I've included. Canals and waterborne transport, the Erie Canal, Complex Water Supply System, New York City, Flood Mitigation Planning, Miami Conservancy District, Irrigated Agriculture in the West, the Colorado System, Hoover Dam, and Multipurpose Systems, TVA. So Ray Lindsley asked me in 76 to write this paper. He suggested that I might find the works of the Miami Conservancy District informative. Ray was a great one for understatement. Thus began my 47-year historical interest in this work and the work of Arthur Morgan, and I revisit it frequently for inspiration. So Arthur Morgan wrote a book, Miami Conservancy District, and it was done in 1951, but it was a rare 25-year post-project effectiveness assessment. It's all about excellent social, political, economic flood engineering. The flood protection works of the Miami Conservancy District have been in place since 1922. They're built following disastrous flooding in March of 1913 in the Dayton, Ohio region. Some 360 bodies were recovered. Hundreds disappeared, never been found. An estimated 20,000 homes were destroyed in Ohio, mainly in the 4,000 square miles Great Miami River Valley. So 20,000 homes, that was a big deal. Hamilton and Dayton suffered the greatest damage. About 10 square miles of Dayton were inundated. To me, this is an excellent example of integrated flood damage, disaster prevention, and systems and life cycle engineering. So Morgan and colleagues published 10 comprehensive technical reports between 1917 and 1922. And the reports describe some of the best scientific hydrology and hydrologic engineering work that has ever been done. So what are the works of the Miami Conservancy District? We'll look at a map, our Ohio River, Hamilton, Dayton, Great Miami River, and that's the basin. Catastrophic flood was March of 13. So we look now at the Great Miami River watershed. And the Conservancy District was established in 1940 to cover the entire catchment and 15 counties. So they had to have some unified way to solve the problem. So there's the district, there are the counties. It provides a model for governance and public infrastructure funding. Pioneering work on reconstructing flood producing rain and assessing future possible major storms. This was exceptional scientific and engineering hydrometeorologic investigation and international data gathering. As a team went through the records five times to try and sort out good and not good data. This is documented in technical reports part five in 1917. So we get a sense now there's a general map of flood control work and railway locations. I look at Hamilton and Pika, 50 mile scale. There are five major dry dams, 
you see them located there. But what's more important, those black areas are channel hydraulic improvements, including 55 miles of levees. But what's even more important, the gaps between levees are open floodplains where flooding could take place without harm to people. I want to show you now the largest of the five dams, Anglewood. It's a dry dam, which means it's just let water run through most of the time. There's the dry side, went eight, eight nine miles across. Has an emergency spillway at the side, and there's the ungated outlet works. It's face sail, fail safe and safe fail design. No human intervention is needed. So if you can't get there to do something when there's a flood on it, it doesn't matter, it works. It was the first US integrated river basin solution. First US dams and levees engineering solution. Flooding and deaths occurred in March of 1913. The designs were started in 1915. The work was completed in 1922. This was a heroic effort. There's not been a flooding problem since the project was completed in 1922. I think a good stop to stop. So examples of exploring developments of tools that may be needed in several decades. So this was detection of climate signals in long-term records. And here's a paper from 1978, climate change detection and its impacts on hydrologic design with my colleague, Dennis Lippmeyer. The simple reality is you need very long records to detect change. I want to provide an example now of the benefit of operating a research site for a relatively long time. And the research site was on UW Eastern campus. Seven plots were constructed in 94. There were 38 feet by one foot deep to determine if adding compost to till-based soil could mitigate deleterious effects of typical suburban lawns. I maintained these plots from 1988 to 2009 personally, largely to do extensive rainfall measurements and observe hydrologic processes. So here we have UW campus showing where it is. The experimental plots were constructed over there, and that's now the site of the university garden. In 2005, see there are two weather stations. There are the plots there, the rest is all brown. Plot one is what I'm going to be talking about. After about several years, the plots were stable, the grass well established, and I put in four pit rain gauges to permit measuring rain accurately. You measure rain up in the wind affected area, you're getting rubbish. So Stephanie Kempf recommended in 2004 that she and I instrument one plot so we could do an accurate water and thermal balance. And the resulting research we showed the calibration and test of a sophisticated soil physics based model and demonstration of the importance of accurate bias free measurements. So the model was, the spatial hydrologic model was Hydrus 2D. It solves Richard's equation for variably saturated flow domain, finite element solution scheme. As part of Steph's doctoral dissertation finished in 2006, and two papers came from that, in, one in 2007, one in 2010. So here's the experimental plot. It's a tool-based soil, 33% gravel, 45% sand, 17% silt, and 5% say. Those white things you see there are pisometers were able to measure the saturated water depth. So how did we figure out the properties of the hillside? It's a controlled experiment training from saturation. You irrigate the saturation, turn off the water supply, and then you measure the outflow hydrograph and soil moisture state. This was done in July 2005 and again in October 2005. So we know the initial conditions. So for model calibration, you determine the soil hydraulic characteristic curves for assumed homogeneous soil. We had no other way to do it. And the calibration inverse simulation, how it went, calibration and testing results are given in detail in the 2007 paper. So there we go, WRR 2007. Parameter estimation for physics-based distributed hydrologic model using measured outflow fluxes and internal moisture states. It wasn't a matter of calibrating and forcing something to match something. So I want to now illustrate model projections for biased and erroneous input time series. And this was a bit of a shocker. 
So you end up with bias in rain <clears throat> and bias in potential evapotranspiration. We have identical initial conditions for all scenarios. So atmospheric measurements, the first of all, this is a TB3 gauge that's wind affected and uncorrectable. And I caught every drop of water that flowed through that gauge and could measure it, so I had to check. We have the same device now, but it's down to pit gauge. It turns out, we learned the hard way, you end up with undercatch in gusty storms. So we add in wind speed. We add in air temperature and relative humidity. We add in shortwave solar, radiation measurements, and atmospheric long wave. We end up net radiation, and we end up with surface temperature. Skin temperature is really tricky to get. Soil heat flux measurements. So we ended up with soil heat flux, soil temperature coming in there so we know what's going on. Internal state measurements, water contents, water content reflectometers, and also with the time domain reflectometers. So output of evapotranspiration. There are five calculation methods that are available to us. First of all, if you just have shortwave radiation and temperature and relative humidity, Turk 61 or Hargraves 85. If you add in net radiation, you can do Priestley and Taylor. If you add in wind, you can do Penrhyn on teeth. And if you add up the other thermal measures, you can do energy budget residual. So increasing measurement requirements, they're all indirect, they're all partially empirical, and they're highly uncertain. So realistically, available since September of 94, we had those, and since 2004, we had those. So I want to show you now calculated ET using the five methods, April 22, 23 of 2005. So we look in here, the top three, uh, energy budget, Pamela Monteith and Priestley Taylor, they're energy-based and empirical-based Turk and Hargraves. But there's something very useful here. That gave a high value, they gave lower values. But if we look at Turk, that's the one down there. And if we multiplied that by two, we came very, very close to the energy budget and the energy budget was the most accurate. So that meant we could use Turk times two as very close to what the real evapotranspiration might be. Okay, so now let's see how this all pans out. These are two pit rain gauges that are just accumulators. And they don't they didn't differ by, by more than two hundredths of an inch in any storm over the 10 years that I was measuring at these places there. So that tells you you have fairly uniform rain across the, the piece there. This one in here is a recording gauge, a hydrologic surfaces, 200 millimeter, 0.2 of a millimeter tip, uh, tipping bucket. Plots one and two that we did a lot of work with. And this one up here, I chose to use as the reference rain gauge. You could equally well use the other one, BG1. So uh, see the late Jim Do, who was a very precious friend supervising my measurement. So you know it was done by the best in the world. The International Hydrology Prize is known as the Doog Medal, and it was named to honor Jim in 2014. He's one of the absolute giants and a very dear friend. So here he is checking on other things there. That was the first gauge we put in in 94. I do not recommend one of those. So if you're using one of those somewhere, I recommend against it. Gauge is installed in checks. I put in a Belfort gauge, then I've got this TB3 and I do the catch underneath it and then an accumulator. So I want to show you what this all means. We had data in 2003, we didn't have any snow problems, so we're just dealing with water and we're going from January 1 through May 31. And don't worry about the scale, it's just telling the accumulated rainfall, the accumulated outflow and so on. So that's the observed flow. And I calibrated the devices for this. This is known within 1%. We look at the surface rain and we look at the pit gauge. Now notice the pit gauge is picking up more water than the surface gauge. Usually people have a surface gauge to work with and it's biased and undercatching and it's uncorrectable. That's the benchmark rain and this game is a shock. Why was my benchmark gauge giving less than this very sophisticated tipping bucket gauge? See a prime example where you end up with a bit more runoff then you have rain. So rain was undercaught there. 
you look there just to measure the sort of bias that you can have. That's pretty big. So in that window there, most of the rain becomes subsurface flow and more water is lost to ET. Now I want to look at measured and modeled cumulative fluxes and the ET, the shortwave radiation, temperature, relative humidity, Turk of 61. That's showing you Turk, that's Turk times two. All right. So now we're going to look at measured and modeled cumulative fluxes. And the model flow is using the calibrated hydrus model. So if I use surface rain and low ET, let me just back that up. We have that uh, Moby color there. It looks pretty good. Most of us would get excited if it looked that good. Then if we use surface rain and high ET, which is much closer to what we should be using, that looks terrible. And we should be paying a lot of attention to that. If we use the pit rain gauge in high ET, we get that. And that's also not so good. So there's a 19% error if we use the real close to ET and the typically measured rain that people would have. So let's do that again. Surface rain and low ET, surface rain and high ET, and pit rain gauge and high ET. Now let's look at the bias and our benchmark relative to the reference the, the gauge. That arrow is the same size there. So almost the entire error was the bias in measuring the rain. So the outcome of that, the use of biased wind affected rain catch and low potential ET yielded about the correct cumulative hydrograph. Modern methods of model parameter estimation would have used these typically available erroneous signals to determine hill slope hydraulic properties. Any such calibrated model would yield about the right answer concerning stream flow, but have completely wrong soil water properties. Such a model would be unsuitable and indefensible for prediction of changed land use or for changed inputs, e.g. climate change. The TB3's pit gauge undercatch results from funnel airflow restrictions in the siphon delivery system in gusty storms. I found this out the hard way. I've indicated to the manufacturer Back in 2013, they still saw it without any caveats. This is documented in Camp and Burgess Journal of Hydrology 2010. And there's the paper quantifying the water balance in a planar hill slope plot affects of measurement errors on flow prediction. So let's look at take home message. Unknown time varying biases and stochastic errors in precipitation and potential ET cannot be corrected or represented by any plausible Bayesian prior distributions. There is no substitute for accurate model input time series. Rain gauge undercatch has been known for many years. For example, John Rodder at Wallingford, UK. And here we have 1967, the rainfall measurement problem, John Rodder. So here have ground level pit gauge and standard height Met Office MK2, that stands up one foot. So for five years, the mean monthly difference between standard and ground level catches for the experiments, say so looking up there, 85% to 100%. So if you look there for January through May, and you're on the order of about 8%, that's still low, that's still low there. So you look at an undercatch of about 8%, and it's uncorrectable. So we can make substantial progress by putting in place hydrologic useful rain measuring networks and we wrote about this in 2007, but most people just cite work without reading it. So here we have water resource research, challenges in obtaining reliable measurements of point rainfall. So we must make substantially improved measurements from which we can determine unbiased evaporative fluxes. And the other thing I want to emphasize is study excellent work from the past. So I recommend that you read the technical reports of the Miami Conservancy District. The last of them was published 102 years ago. And there's exceptional scholarship in these reports and we can all gain insights from them. I want to offer up now, before we finish, three papers to offer some guidance for improving hydrologic measurement and modeling. And the first up here, I'm part of involved here, the case for an open water balance, re-envisaging network design and data analysis for complex uncertain world. If you want to get a single paper that tells you about errors, it's in here. My excellent colleague in Geoscience Letters 2021, Roy Seidel, 
wrote this wonderful paper, Strategies for Smarter Catchment Hydrology Models, Incorporating Scalar and Better Process Representation. I want to just emphasize this part here. This discussion focuses mostly on conceptual and physical -based, process-based models where understanding the internal catchment processes and hydrologic pathways is important. Such hydrologic models can be improved by using data from advanced remote sensing, both spatial and temporal, and derivatives, applications of machine learning, flexible structures, and informing models through nested catchment studies in which internal catchment processes are elucidated. Uh, Roy is one of the most skilled field hydrologists that I know. This one I was quite surprised about. In Nature in 2021, widespread woody plant use of water stored. And I want to emphasize this part. Temporal and spatial patterns of bedrock water use across the continental United States indicated that woody plants extensively access bedrock water for transpiration. That's not included in any of our models that I'm aware of. So we need to do that to include. And last part is something I picked up last week. Water for food now and in the future. I, I recommend to you the March 24, 2024 UNESCO report and the United Nations World Water Development Report, Water for Prosperity and Peace. There's quite a lot of useful stuff in there that you might find helpful. And I think I'm almost there. This is an exciting time for research and professional practice in hydrology and water resources engineering. If I was younger, I'd be really jumping up and down. There's much work to be done. It's essential that accurate measurements be used. And I'll leave it at that. And uh, I still do feel work. <laughs>